Hi there. Um, I'm Teresa Williamson, Executive Director of Catalytic Communities, an NGO that's been working in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil since 2000, supporting community organizers from the city's favelas. I want to thank Alexander von Hoffman for the invitation to present to your class. Um, I'm an urban planner, so uh, I hope that what I bring will help um, students reflect on urban planning, especially the role of communities, grassroots communities, informal settlements in urban design, and a bunch of other uh, topics that I think can be um, reflected on from what I'm going to present, which is very much uh, material from the ground, from, from Rio, from the favelas. Uh, I wanted to mention that the talk is broadly uh, divided into two sections, one talking about favelas, um, over time and historically and their role um, and what kind of communities these are and the other about our organization catalytic communities, which I decided to share quite a bit about because I think it could be instructive for people who are thinking about grassroots approaches to urban planning. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through the slides because there's a lot of material. Um, I like to give talks like this. I just sort of provide a lot of content um, and I make the slides available to you. Uh, and so I'm going to show right now my screen and you'll see the presentation. Um, and uh, all of the slides are available at the link at the bottom there, bit.ly slash favela GSD. Make sure you get the capital F GSD, and then you have access to all these slides. So if there's anything that I go through too fast, obviously you have the video, but you can also check back in um, on the link uh, and take advantage of the material that I'm including. So basically there are some slides I might go through pretty quickly um, or just touch on, but that's because I think it's important for you to have the content, even if I can't go into too much detail about all of it. So again, I'm Teresa Williamson. I'm an urban planner. I've been working with grassroots communities here in Rio for 21 years. Uh, and hopefully the talk I bring today is gonna bring some uh, insight um, into their role in the city and um, globally the relevance of these neighborhoods. So just to start off, um, it's important to always remember that a third of people living in cities today lives in informal settlements. And actually 85% of housing worldwide is built uh, quote, illegally. So we're talking about these communities not being a fringe um, in the world, but actually being the main uh, way that urbanization happens in a lot of the developing world and also in parts of the developed world, right? We can think about 10 cities and informal settlements in the United States as well. Now, by 2050, the UN estimates nearly a third of humanity will live in these settlements, which means that uh, thinking about how to work with them and think of them differently and, and plan for them uh, is essential if for urban planning globally. Um, and basically we have an option, and this is something that I'm gonna really hammer at in my talk. We have an option between thinking of these communities as a problem that has to be overcome, which is what we've been doing for a hundred years and hasn't worked, or looking at them through a different lens, seeing them for what they are, which is essentially a response, a solution response to a need, which is housing and shelter. Um, and then learning from these communities, how we can plan for them and improve on them, um, especially the ones that become consolidated. So my goal today is to provide a framework through which we can shatter our current lens about informal settlements and learn to value uh, their development um, and their role to create truly inclusive, vibrant, resilient, and sustainable cities ultimately. Uh, and I'll do this by pr producing and sharing on the ground perspectives from Rio. So quick background on Rio and its favelas, the backdrop to this world. Uh, most people have seen and know what the city of Rio looks like from postcard shots of the city, uh, but very few people, including those who live here, are aware of the, what's, what's going on under the ground, literally uh, the underbelly of the city historically. Uh, Rio's port received five times more enslaved Africans than the entire United States. Um, and slavery in Brazil lasted 60% longer than the United States. Most people, uh, even in Rio, are not aware of this history. And it is significant and important for understanding the city as it has evolved. Uh, the first favela was actually formed in 1897 within 10 years of abolition by um, former enslaved Brazilians who uh, were, had served in battle 
um, and were supposed to be paid and were not. Uh, and they were supposed to be paid in land. And so they came and squatted on a hill uh, and they called it Favela Hill. Today it's called Providencia uh, and that favela still exists. Uh, and so we think about, you know, 1800s, what was going on in Brazil? Why did favelas start, uh, start um, developing? Um, it was a mix of the abolition of slavery, the lack of affordable housing for this population. Uh, rural land was very unequally distributed. So people moved to the cities very early compared to most of the developing world. Rio was the capital. So it was the, the major city that people wanted to go to. And the hillsides were set aside as um, public land. And so they were an easy target for the first squatters. Uh, and again, favelas start as squatters, um, but now hundred years later, they're no longer squatters. So um, now just to summarize 123 years of policies since then, basically what we've seen is cycles of neglect and repression, uh, very little investment uh, by the authorities. Uh, however, residents do invest. Residents build and they rebuild their communities over time. So today in Rio, we actually have about a thousand favelas. They house nearly 22 to 24% of the population. Uh, most of them are 50 year old communities at least. These are established communities um, and they range in size and characteristics. I'll show you a bunch of pictures. You'll see how uh, diverse they are. But basically they're all over the urban fabric. You can see here in oranges and reds, favelas in all of the zones of the city. Uh, you, whether you're in the south zone, you see them all over. Whether you're in the north zone, you see them all over. Uh, they often are established around an employment opportunity. People squat on land nearby. And over time, they build those communities out, even if the government is neglecting or repressing resident voices. So with that background, um, I want to sort of reintroduce favelas. Uh, I want to uh, suggest a reframing of these communities. And this reframing comes from our own work on the ground over 20 years. Uh, so if we actually stop and say, okay, what defines all favelas? What do they all have in common? I mentioned already, they're not squatters uh, because they've been around so long, they actually have adverse possession rights, squatters rights in Brazil, their constitutional rights. Uh, they're not slums because, you know, even if you look at the material, uh, it's brick, concrete, reinforced steel homes. Uh, they're no longer living in shanties. Um, and for the most part, the living conditions are better than what we think of as slum conditions. Uh, so how do we define them? Um, well, first, they're simply neighborhoods that develop as a solution for the unmet need for housing. Second, there's no outside regulation, so there's no government oversight about how, the, oops, sorry. There's no government oversight about how they develop. Uh, they're built by residents for residents, so it's not a speculative relationship. There's nobody coming in and building a bunch of housing. Residents build it themselves, and they constantly evolve based on culture, access to resources, jobs, knowledge, and the city. So literally, they're just evolving day to day, week to week. Um, their constant evolution. And so these are the things that characterize favelas. They are not, no, none of them are objectively good or bad. Uh, they are just characteristics of how these neighborhoods develop in a different way from formal neighborhoods. Again, they often start as squatters, shanty shacks or slums, but as they evolve, they cease being characterized by those conditions. And over time, they actually become consolidated. You can see here on the right, a picture of a community building out their own sewage system you know, whereby the building stock, access to some services, community ties, and a way of life become firmly established in the community, even when tenure may still be elusive. Put another way, favelas are affordable housing, informal, self-built, and unique. So while they're born of neglect, at their core, favelas are solution factories. First, they address the need for shelter, but then they go well beyond. And I'm gonna give now some examples of these different needs um, that favelas address, starting with shelter. So some of you will be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs from psychology. It's a basic pyramid that includes all of uh, human needs from physiological all the way up through self-actualization. And uh, obviously the basic needs for survival are those at the base. So air, food, shelter, right? Water. 
And so um, I like to use this to illustrate something that I think we as planners have um, conflated in the last few decades, planners, uh, uh, government officials, uh, the private sector, which is shelter and property. Uh, as you can see, shelter is a basic need. Property is uh, on the second rung considered a security need. Um, and so it's important for us to recognize this because there is essentially a 20% rule uh, in housing. And it makes uh, sense from the perspective of markets that at least 20% of the population of any city can't afford market rate housing, right? Because of the cost of land, construction, the private sector won't ever meet the needs of the 20% poorest in a city. Sometimes this number can be much higher, 30, 40, 50%, depending on the city. Uh, and so governments might put in uh, different types of incentives, subsidies, um, rent control, uh, uh, and so on. But uh, in the developing world, right, the solution for this has been historically uh, informal settlements. So at their very core, favelas are simply addressing a basic human need that's not being addressed otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have public housing here of quality. Uh, we don't have, or sufficient, we don't have uh, co-ops or other more affordable housing, uh, nonprofit housing opportunities. And so that's why we end up with informal settlements. And that's also the reason that in the US we're seeing the growth of homelessness and tent cities. So in Rio, going back to the first point around uh, our racial legacy um, and, and um, slavery in Brazil and its impacts, uh, you can actually see on the map of the city uh, the uh, racial breakdown and how it overlaps with the breakdown in favelas and low-income areas of the city. So now let's talk about, well, what happens as these communities develop? So as residents take planning or development into their own hands individually or collectively, we actually find that favelas uh, have a, several qualities that we as planners are trying to build into sustainable communities and cities. There are affordable housing in central areas. In the case of Rio in particular, favelas are all over the urban fabric as I showed. They're efficient and responsive architecture. So people build houses based on their need um, and uh, grow those homes around the needs that present themselves uh, rather than you know, extraneous uh, or extra um, luxurious or other types of use. Um, they're low rise, high density, uh, which means there's low social isolation, which it means that in normal times, non-COVID times, um, this produces a lot of exchanges on the street. Uh, people know each other. They're pedestrian area centered, which means no cars, no strangers, um, which means kids can often circulate more freely than in other types of neighborhoods. Of course, this is impacted. This has changed in the case of communities with a lot of um, drug uh, gang police fighting, uh, but that's a different issue from the planning of the physical environment. Um, I won't go into all of these, but we can talk about them uh, if anyone's interested. You know, we've been able to document sociocultural assets of favelas, urbanistic and economic qualities of favelas. Um, there was a study in 2014 at the end of the economic boom here in Brazil, uh, that the average wage in favelas in that period had increased 55%. In the previous 10 years, which was significantly more than the national average, you know, 81% of favelas uh, residents liked favelas, 91.4% of them considered themselves happy. Uh, and at the same time, we did a study a few years ago uh, with a lead ND, one of the architects who created the lead ND certification, comparing a favela to the Olympic Village, which was lead certified. And we actually found that a favela near there, Aza Branca, uh, uh, scored higher uh, or would have scored higher on several uh, elements of the lead framework, including neighborhood pattern and design uh, and location and linkages. So we're seeing that favelas actually, uh, if we think of them differently, they can be part of the solution, right? Uh, this is an example of a favela, Vale Encantado, which is in the middle of the forest uh, that's developed their own sewage system uh, to uh, make sure that the, the sewage from their small community doesn't go into the forest uh, uh, without treatment. 
At the same time, the city at large has major problems with sewage treatment, not just in favelas. So once the system is finished, it's going to be the cleanest sewage in the city of Rio. Uh, this is the site of a park where city authorities had thrown debris from a demolition of houses in a favela two decades ago. They had left the debris, uh, it had accumulated into piles of trash over years, and then residents went in and cleaned it up and created this incredible oasis um, next to the community that residents and visitors can enjoy. Uh, you know, when it comes to culture, there's no doubt everyone knows that pretty much every cultural manifestation that's associated with Rio has either been developed in or is maintained in favelas, whether it's samba or new uh, music, new dance forms like pasinho, um, whether it's visual arts, whether it's uh, carnival celebrations, capoeira, um, mm. and here you see the passing with the Olympic games. Uh, so these are all products of favelas and their cultural wealth. Um, and so when we stop to think about these communities in relation to the city at large, uh, it becomes clear that it's not that the informal is the absence of the formal. That's a really problematic way to look at these communities. They're actually just a different logic structure. There are different ways of life, right? Um, so the formal city, for example, that's logic uh, tries to limit complexity, make things planned and organized. Favelas, because of the lack of regulation, they lead to increasing complexity. And we're gonna talk a little bit about complexity in a minute. Um, the financial or bureaucratic barriers to entry in the formal city can be broken through relate broke uh, can be administered through relationships in favelas. You know, you have a centralized or status based master planning in the case of Rio um, historically, whereas in favelas you have adaptive and iterative planning. Um, you know, services and exchanges can be monetized in the formal city and favelas they're often demonetized. You know, people provide support through or help through mutual support, a uh, self build, um, and it allows people to break out of poverty. You know, so over time, as they become consolidated, and this is critical because very new favelas obviously shouldn't exist. It, it, they should be given better opportunities for housing. Um, but once favelas are consolidated, if they continue to develop informally, they can become increasingly complex. And that can actually be a hallmark of resiliency complexity. And I'll talk about that next, but it can also breed chaos. So we'll talk about that as well. So identifying the sort of sweet spot um, once communities are established and ensuring they can continue to control their own planning, but that they can be planned by residents then becomes the paramount uh, way forward. So I'm borrowing some slides here from David Krakauer of the Santa Fe Institute, which is an institute that studies complexity. Um, and he, this is just showing natural systems and how when we think of sort of, when we think of natural systems like ecosystems that are adaptive, they're actually at this uh, level of randomness or chaos um, that is sort of, you might call a sweet spot of complexity. So you can see there, um, on the y-axis, the increase in complexity. And then you can see that uh, the top most complex and diverse and resilient uh, systems are those that have a, a reasonable amount of complexity randomness, right? He applies the same logic to art. And of course, this is totally subjective, um, but the idea that you get to a certain level of complexity and there's something, um, there's something uh, compelling about that, but then it gets beyond that and it gets too much, it's too chaotic. So uh, with his permission, I applied the same logic to settlements, human environments. You know, I think of the least, the most regular being like cul-de-sac suburbs and then relatively planned cities. And then you might think of informal settlements um, or particularly vibrant cities where people, where some level of informality and spontaneity is fostered as being those environments that reach that sort of sweet spot of complexity um, before things become too chaotic where they're just uh, unadmini ad unadministrable, right? And so it could be that those favelas that reach a sweet spot of complexity are then able to solidify those qualities that they've established without escalating into like a dysfunction, hold the key to vibrant and sustainable urbanization around the world. As cities develop, they are developing informally um, in much of the world. And so how do we 
find that sweet spot. And also, how do we take cities who are that are already developed and have lost a lot of their spark because they're overly planned? How do we bring some of that spontaneity back into the urban fabric? And I think favelas are instructive for us to think about these issues. I'm going to show you a bunch of images now of different communities here in Rio with different levels of government investment. You'll always see street life. You'll always see exchanges among residents. Of course, these pictures were taken before the pandemic. Uh, when people were out in the street and not wearing masks. Um, now there's some mask use. Of course, it's, it's also complicated. A lot of these folks have to go out to work every day and that's a whole other issue that I'll touch on at the end of this talk. Um, but yeah, so we have here examples where the government is not um, providing services. Uh, we have other examples where it's ad hoc, or poor quality utilities and services, um, you know, communities having to figure out their own water supply uh, often doesn't work out, sometimes it's okay. Um, but the social fabric that results, the safety, uh, the sense of community, the ability to support each other among residents um, and break out of poverty, um, improve their lives, have a very strong quality of, of uh, family and community life. This is an example of where a community photographer helped stop a set of eviction plans by uh, organizing, by getting the residents of the houses that were set aside for eviction to sit for photographs. And he would put the huge photos of them on the walls of their homes so that if the demolition crews came in, we would get these images of people's faces being battered by the demolition crews. And he was able to, uh, to stop or slow down or stop that set of evictions and help slow down the eviction of the community at large. So favela residents um, who take advantage of the qualities of informality, realizing their own creative improvements while also fighting for access to services appear to make the greater development inroads over time. This is a, a finding of our organization's work over two decades that favelas that um, don't wait for the authorities to do things, but also uh, don't not appeal to the authorities. They do both. They do their own thing. They, they look for uh, ways to improve the quality of their communities and uh, collectively and individually, but they also um, fight for public uh, improvements. So now with that um, introduction to favelas, I thought I would then focus the second part of the talk on our organization um, and why we do the work we do, how we do it. Um, uh, Catalytic Communities was a product of my PhD in city planning. I was very lucky, I was at Penn and my advisor turned to me and said, when I had the idea for the nonprofit and said, why don't you start the nonprofit and write your dissertation about it? And so this was 21 years ago and he gave me an incredible opportunity to focus um, my life now on this project. and. Uh, as a result, because it was part of a dissertation, the organization was built um, in a very reflective and experimental way. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of, of how we've designed the nonprofit to support favela organizers uh, in the following two sections before we conclude. Um, but now I'm gonna talk about CATCOM, like what do we do? What are our projects? And then I'm gonna talk about our approach. So again, we've been around 21 years and um, even though we're very much focused on Rio and the favelas of Rio, we do see our work as creating models for effective community-led people-centered integration of informal and formal settlements around the world. Um, for the first decade, uh, we were focused on building community and online spaces to network local organizers. Um, we had a community center in downtown Rio for local leaders to organize and use the web before it was available. We had a community solutions database on the internet recognized by the Tech Awards uh, to provide a place where communities could share their local solutions. These were translated. Um, from 2010 to 2016, we became very much focused on the pre-Olympic period and documenting uh, the human rights violations that unfortunately were happening uh, over that time. Uh, we launched Rio and Watch, which is our publication, which exists to this day. And we work with international journalists to change the way they reported on favelas to get them closer to local organizers and residents to voice uh, the local reality rather than the stigma 
um, that had always dominated uh, the way these communities were seen. So very particular to CAPCOM is that we actually see our organization as having a life cycle um, that works itself out over four pillars. So our ultimate goal is to see the integration and development of favelas in Rio and elsewhere. Um, and to do this, we see four concrete areas. So networking local organizers, communicating about favelas, developing models of uh, how they can develop sustainably um, into integrated formal but not informal, <laughs> sorry, integrated neighborhoods that um, have maintained the qualities of informality while formalizing uh, enough that they can um, operate in, in a safe way. Um, and then global advocacy. And if you look at the same uh, four pillars over time, you'll see that um, we have periods in our development as an organization where we emphasized each of these four elements, though they've always all been part of our work. Right now, we're in the phase of model development where our focus is on uh, the project's the Sustainable Favela Network and Favela Community Land Trusts um, as a way to strengthen local organizing and solutions on the ground. I'll talk about all four of our current programs um, in the next couple sets of slides. So uh, to understand what we do, we have Rio and Watch, which is our community reporting site. If you haven't checked it out, please do. Uh, it's a bilingual Portuguese English news site from favelas uh, since 2010. And our focus there is to fix the underlying narrative of favelas and deepen the conversation and growing the nuance around these communities. Uh, we have the Sustainable Favela Network, which is a network with hundreds of local organizers from the favelas. Uh, we work to expose, boost, and grow their sustainable models for community development. Um, we have our Favela Community Land Trust Project, which is around land rights, which works to design and implement a comprehensive land titling strategy to safeguard community assets. And then finally, just launched last year, is the uh, unified um, uh, the, the unified dashboard for COVID-19 in the favelas. It's uh, a tool for getting visibility um, and exposure for uh, the impact of the pandemic on these communities. It's gonna grow into a broader data program around crowdsourcing data through community sources around different issues. Um, so these programs, the first three, this is how they work as a cycle, right? So we catalytic communities started in around 20, in, in the early 2000s, um, focused on grassroots organizing support. But what we realized in 2010, when Rio was selected to host the Olympics and started implementing changes um, the, at the city level, was that because favelas were seen in, in such a counterproductive and inaccurate way, um, that their development was going to be stimmied uh, always by the authorities. There were gonna be evictions, there was gonna be top-down planning, um, imposing improvements in ways that were gonna harm communities uh, just as much or if maybe more than benefit them at times. And so we realized we had to sort of go back on this dial and focused on the narrative. Why were favelas seen this way? How should they be seen? How do residents see them? How do they really pan out when it comes to their sustainable elements or non? Um, and so we went back and again, we focused on that shifting the narrative piece, Rion Watch for that period. And now we're back in the grassroots organizing area. But if you take this as a cycle, you realize, okay, first we have to change the way these communities are seen um, so that we see them through an asset lens, which I'm gonna share a bit more about later in this talk. Um, and then you have to go into thinking about them in terms of grassroots organizing. How do you support their organizing on the ground to build solutions? And then from there, we think about, okay, so as communities develop, as they advocate for improvements from authorities, how do we stop gentrification? And how do we make, guarantee that communities can stay there, that they're not gonna be evicted? And so then the Favela Community Land Trust Program comes in. So I'll talk about each of these. I'll go through these slides super quick, but they're here so you can look at them again. Rion Watch started in 2010 when we saw an official narrative about developing favelas, about urbanizing, upgrading favelas, about community policing that was very positive, but actually Cadillac communities, because we've been working for 10 years with these residents and these organizers, we saw a very different reality on the ground. Um, we saw forced evictions, we saw police violence, um, we saw public housing falling you know, to pieces, et cetera. And so we realized <clears throat> that it was necessary to create another opportunity 
um, for, or, uh, for, for communities to present the facts about what was happening. And that's why we created Rio and Watch, um, which you guys should all check out, like I said, uh, and we became known for this work. Um, other things we did under that umbrella, we published a film called What is a Favela? It's available on YouTube, you should check that out. Oops. Um, we produced an eight year longitudinal study of how eight, uh, the eight major global English language news outlets covering Brazil fared in terms of how they looked at favelas. Uh, so you can check that out. We realized uh, meetings between community-based journalists in favelas with uh, journalists from the major outlets. So in this room, you have the Guardian, New York Times, um, Associated Press, uh, and you have community newspapers, Maré de Notícias, Fórum Grita Baixada, uh, Fala Rosa, and others. Uh, so moving on, Sustainable Favela Network. Uh, like I said, this is a network of community-based sustainability projects. The, the seed for this network started in 2012 when we produced the film called Favela as a Sustainable Model, also available in this presentation and on YouTube, uh, that um, presents eight different projects in favelas uh, and looks at how these communities can be uh, models of sustainability, but also the challenges that lie for that. And as we did the filming, we realized the community projects we were featuring had not met each other and how important it would be to create a network and join these folks together. So in 2018, uh, we were able to, or sorry, 2017, we were able to produce the Sustainable Favela Network map. Um, in 2018, uh, we then started a series of exchanges, um, which went through 2019, where we uh, got together community organizers uh, and technical allies from all over the city at different events in different favelas and different local projects. Um, ranging from solar power to community gardens to uh, this is we're doing in this picture we're seeing a, a river uh, a tech, chemical assessment of the river um, we see communities uh, organizing around community museums uh, we see recycling co-ops uh, we see composting programs and all of these things are happening in favelas uh, these are all the local organizers at the front of these projects. The network is really about them. It's about bringing them together to share strategies, share ideas, share solutions, and then build solutions together from there. This is an exchange that we were able to do two years ago in taking a group of community organizers to New York City to meet with organizers there. Um, and this is the final meetup of the Sustainable Favela Network that was face-to-face -face at the end of 20. 19 before the pandemic hit. Um, since then, the same community groups in our network are, have organized around, uh, they've shifted gears. So this is before, for example, this is a group in Peña on the north zone of Rio that was doing agroforestry work before the pandemic. During the pandemic, they turned their attention to providing food staples to families in need who had lost their jobs because of the pandemic um, and making sure it was organic healthy food. Uh, this is another group in Villa Kennedy in the west zone of Rio. This is what they did before the pandemic. They were working on, you know, you can see it's very, you know, meetings, workshops, trainings, uh, sports programs, literacy, tutoring. Uh, they have these wonderful facilities. Uh, they turned all of their attention during the pandemic to getting food, distributing masks, uh, and, and supporting residents through the pandemic. The network as a whole, rather than doing face-to-face -face exchanges in 2020, realized live public teach-ins um, on a variety of topics. You can see here on the right, uh, there was one on how the pandemic is impacting waste pickers who do the recycling in Brazil. Uh, there was one on whether solar energy in the favelas is possible. And all of these teach-ins are available online and we have articles about them. So feel free to reach out if any of this material is of interest to you. Um, this is the film, it's embedded here in the article. It's got English subtitles uh, that summarizes all of our activities last year, um, all these online activities, including a mayoral debate. So the Sustainable Favela Network actually hosted a debate with the candidates for mayor of Rio. Oops, sorry. You don't need that. Okay. And then finally, um, the Sustainable Favela Network also produced a museum and memory guide. So uh, anyone who wants to check out the community museums and favelas across Rio now has a guide to do so. 
So now I'm going to talk about our third big program, the Favela Community Land Trust Project. This came out of the recognition that communities were not secure despite adverse possession and squatters rights being so strong and enshrined in Brazil's constitution. Um, in the pre-Olympic period, we saw a community called Vila Autodromo and uh, dozens of others evicted um, with, without, you know, without just compensation and sometimes without just arguments. Uh, in this case, um, you can see from the top left, it was a community that was quite es established. It was um, even scenic. Um, it was very calm. Uh, you can see the police violence that was involved in reaching the final uh, end. You can see on the bottom right that 20 houses remained at the end. The city built 20 homes for the 20 families that resisted till the end. The other 600 to 700 families were evicted. Um, they were given compensation, but there was a lot of uh, issues around that compensation, which I can discuss with anyone who's interested. But basically, in that pre-Olympic period, we saw 80,000 people evicted from um, the central and northern parts of the city that are close to jobs and opportunities to the extreme west zone of the city, uh, where those things are missing. And this is a quote from Maria da Peña, who's a resident of Vila Autodromo, the one that was beaten up in the previous image. Uh, she said, Titles don't guarantee we can stay on our land because I had two concessions of use from the state and to be able to stay, I practically died. So Vila Autodromo actually had land titles. Most of the residents there had physical paper that said they could stay on the land. Um, and so it just shows how tenuous these uh, rights are. This is an image available on YouTube with the video uh, with a woman is actually um, in a favela in the south zone of Rio, which is the, the developed touristy area that was going through a period of gentrification in the pre-Olympic period, where she is saying, I don't want title. We don't want title. So she's actually arguing against the titling of her community because she, in her case, she realized that title, titling was going to produce gentrification. And she didn't, her big fear is not being able to stay where she is. Um, and, and in her case, titling would have encouraged her uh, inability to stay. Um, and so you see in the cases of Vila Autodromo and Babylonia and others that the issue of titling is, is, is severe because it can, you can be given one and it may not matter. And you can also uh, be given one and it can produce um, gentrification. So it can produce eviction or gentrification despite um, the issue. We also saw a period in pre-Olympic Rio where there was active, um, there was, there were, people were active in gentrifying favelas to the point where the Financial Times actually published a buying guide uh, comparing the value of investing in Vigigal, which is a favela, versus homes in Ipanema or Copacabana, which are uh, wealthy formal neighborhoods. So at that time, back in 2012, uh, we hosted a set of workshops in the, that community called Vijigao uh, around gentrification to support residents understanding the phenomenon and deciding what they wanted to do about it. Uh, that led the community to hold a number of public debates in the public square on gentrification. And it also led us to think about how, what can be done and so in that process, you know, what can be done when it's the market and people are selling their homes of their own free will? Um, and so that's when we started thinking about bringing the community land trust model to the favelas. Um, some of you will be familiar with community land trusts in the US, typically a nonprofit in a city like, you know, the, the biggest one in the US is in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, there's a very famous one near you guys, Dudley Street. Um, and so they, buy or have access to land and they develop housing and they own the land. So the, the, the trust owns the land and they sell or lease or rent the housing to low-income families. Um, and so we thought, well, what if instead of community favelas getting titled individually or not getting titled at all, um, which produce uh, eviction threats or gentrification threats, what if they were titled collectively to the land and individually to their homes. So we essentially retrofit a community land trust model as favelas are titled. And so uh, this idea has been percolating now for several years. I'll show you some images showing 
this process. These photos I'm showing now are of drawings by Rodrigo Binax, who's the artist responsible for the video we're currently producing about favela community land trusts. But basically they put an end to forced displacement, but then they also empower communities to make improvements because the CLT requires collective organizing. And so communities become empowered. Uh, there are a host of qualities of these communities. Um, we were very lucky in 2017 to learn about uh, the most successful community land trusts in informal settlements in the world, which happened in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And then in 2018, we were able to bring those organizers from Puerto Rico to Rio, where they introduced the model they developed in their favelas, where they um, got collective title through a community land trust that helped preserve the community to this day and will for many, many years. Uh, they came to Rio. We did a series of workshops involving community organizers, public officials, academics, and others. And that led to the formation of the Favela Community Land Trust Working Group, which now has about 200 members, including public um, servants, uh, many community organizers and researchers and others from housing movements. Um, we typically do these workshops in favelas that are interested, where we assess their positive, negative qualities of the community, why they want title and why they may not want title. And then we see whether a community land trust would be a good fit for them or a different model would be better. And then finally, our fourth big project at the moment uh, is the Favelas Unified Dashboard, which is focused on COVID-19 in its first year. It formed because of COVID-19. Uh, and it basically came to be because of the significant underreporting that is happening in favelas. Um, and we saw that with, you know, without data, we can't uh, address the problem. And favelas basically weren't being, no, no data were being collected by favelas, even though we know that favelas are the most impacted areas of our city by the pandemic for a whole range of factors. Um, economically, they've been affected and uh, the fact that um, residents can't, uh, uh, sometimes can't access water, um, hygiene supplies, the density, the intergenerational living, many things make favelas high risk zones for COVID. And so, <clears throat> Um, this is a slide just showing some of the articles we published on Rio and Watch, showing how favelas self-organized to address the pandemic in the absence of government um, involvement. Uh, and they even collected their own data. So uh, what started happening is some of the favelas that are more organized started collecting data on their own development. We brought these folks together um, and we've had weekly meetings since uh, May. Um, and we developed collectively the unified dashboard where all of the different communities that are collecting data, we put all the data together. We are also now collecting data through zip code estimations, thanks to a partnership with Brazil's National Health Foundation, Fiu Cruz. Um, and so, and now just recently we've launched a campaign for vaccines in favelas um, immediately uh, for them to be prioritized given their risks. So this is the COVID dashboard. Again, I can go into a lot more detail on any of our projects. They're all a, a whole fountain of action, activity, knowledge, um, and, and resources. So feel free to reach out to me. So in this final section, I'm just going to talk about our approach as an organization, which I think, you know, may be useful to young planners that are thinking about going out there and uh, taking a more grassroots perspective or working internationally. Uh, very instructive in our work has been the framework of community of asset based community development. Uh, when we apply the framework to our work in favelas, this is sort of how it comes out. If you think about traditional government engagement with communities like favelas, they focus on their deficiencies. Asset based community development focuses on community assets. Uh, government focuses on responding to problems and bringing in technical solutions. Asset-based community development looks at opportunities and assets as a springboard. So, okay, what does the community have going for it? How can we address the challenges from using the qualities that this community has? Uh, it's much more of a nuanced design process and uh, lower tech. Um, you know, government thinks of favelas as places of charity or favors that have to be given, made, uh, whereas Asset-based community development looks at them as places worthy of investment and rights. 
um, and so on. You can go down this whole list thinking about how experts from the government versus mutual exchange with technical allies, which is how you would approach it in an asset-based community development framework. Um, people in a government framework are beneficiaries, but in the asset-based approach, they're co-creators and they're in control of the process. So uh, I really recommend spending some time on this slide, reflecting on what it means. You know, if we had thought of Vila Autodromo through an asset-based lens, we would have had a totally different policy towards this community. This was a community with no crime. It was a community with high school rates for the young people. A lot of people moved to this favela from other favelas to improve their lives. So it was a community of opting in. Um, it was pretty much everyone there wanted to be there. Uh, and it was lovely. Uh, it was a lovely place to be. Um, there's, you know, it was near jobs uh, and, and so on. It just needed some investment and which was totally possible. Um, so we didn't look at that that way. We thought, oh, there's a favela next to the Olympic site. Ah, what a blight. Um, and collectively as a society, that's the decision that was made. Um, in terms of you know, evictions, again, 80,000 people were evicted because we don't see the qualities of these communities. Um, so our approach is to learn from favelas. Everything catalytic communities does, we think about, okay, how do favelas do this uh, when they work well? You know, the favelas that work well, that organize well, because a favela is really an ecosystem. It's where people live um, and they're very diverse, very resilient uh, in many ways. How do we take that into our approach? So um, again, you can visit the slide later. I'm gonna go into this one and the next one in a little bit more detail because um, they build on that last one, but they explain it a bit more. So I'm gonna explain a bit about how we look at community planning and then how we look at organizational planning within our own organization. Uh, before we conclude. So first of all, do no harm. That's just the baseline. Um, everything we do as planners or in our organizations and lives should aim to do no harm. So um, in working with favelas that are consolidated, it's especially critical to do this because they breed so much complexity that we can't as designers, planners possibly know if we're doing more harm than good without actually uh, working with residents through the other elements of this framework. So we follow an asset-based framework, identifying the qualities before we start addressing issues. Again, because uh, not only can we use qualities and assets as a springboard for development, but actually um, we can also, we also realize that if we don't recognize they're there, often the policies that are created will unravel the assets. They'll damage the assets. So that list of qualities favelas have, um, you know, Affordability, for example, that can be easily lost through land titling that isn't thinking about affordability, maintaining affordability as one of the assets in the community. And the same goes for physical design. Uh, identify grassroots organizers committed to the collective improvement of their communities and work with those people. That's basically the bread and butter of catalytic communities. That's what we do. Uh, we work with those folks. They're the ones who know the community. They're the ones who are committed to it, regardless of anything else. They're staying there. They're the ones who need to be supported um, and, and offered uh, all sorts of um, encouragement. Uh, fourth, offer strategic support, again, to these organizers, right? And also um, initiatives that they, that they manage. Um, ask residents what they think and want. It's actually not rocket science to figure out what favelas need. Um, it's really easy. You just talk to residents. Um, so often uh, planners will come in and create these, you know, top-down assessments of needs when, and that actually, like I said, will unravel assets if they're addressed without uh, careful consideration. Um, always learn with and from community partners remembering that they're the ones who know what's going on. They're the ones with the most critical knowledge. Um, and then remember that trust is the number one asset in this process. So nothing can be done that compromises trust. And sometimes that means you have to slow down, reflect, apologize, start again. Um, and finally, don't rush. Uh, on the one hand, we're talking about urgent situations sometimes in favelas that need urgent responses. Um, and that's one thing. But ideally we get to a point where we're planning and working with communities and those urgent things are not running the planning process. Um, so we can do things carefully, uh, considering these communities for the unique neighborhoods they are and supporting their development um, individually. 
So related to those or building on those, that framework about community planning, I'm gonna talk quickly about our organization and how we manage and how these elements might be useful to other grassroots organizations. And of course, if you think of things that we could learn from, please share with us as well. Um, so first of all, we have a mission, we stick to it, but we're constantly adjusting our strategy. It depends on what are the current needs, demands, opportunities. Like when the pandemic hit, we literally pivoted overnight. We shifted all our programming. We maintained all our community meetings, moved them online. We started having weekly uh, affect, affectionate rounds with, with leaders to hear them on Zoom, hear what was happening, see how we could support them. Um, so that need to be able to pivot and respond quickly, but sticking to the goal. Um, experiment with programs, don't take things too seriously. So if there's something we need to, we wanna try, try it, but understand it's an experiment initially, and then later invest in programs. All of the projects I mentioned here, the Rion Watch, the Sustainable Favela Network, Camille Landra's project, and also projects that we had in the past were all seen as experiments initially. Um, we only stuck to the ones that produced useful outcomes for, uh, for community organizers. Evaluate actions constantly, not like every other year or every year, but just every day, get input, feedback, hear from residents, incorporate that immediately into the conversations and the process. Um, develop all programs as networks. So it's amazing because if, if, you know, if you develop something as a network, you're creating all sorts of value for the participants, even if a program is still very small, because people get so much out of talking to other people and sharing with other people. So that's an easy way to have a huge impact and it strengthens programs as they grow. Mm -hmm. uh, engage in multiple simultaneous approaches. So whatever we're trying to do, we're trying to do it from several angles. Some are being emphasized at any time, but that way we can respond again, quickly adjusting our strategy as opportunities and needs change. Um, be in constant conversation. Uh, like I said, you know, this, this, and not only with community organizers which obviously are the focus, but also international organizations, other NGOs in your community, um, and see yourselves as part of an ecosystem. It's not on here, but it should be. So we, we see our work very much as a niche in an ecosystem that needs every piece. So all civil society, all community organizers, organizations, NGOs, uh, media groups, everybody that's contributing to the single, we're all together in this. Um, document everything, collect real-time data and feedback, and then commit to the programs that are having unquestionable impacts. If something is in high demand from communities that we're doing, we find a way to keep it going, even if it involves relying mostly on volunteers um, or uh, reducing slight the scale a little bit at a time or focus, reshifting a certain focus, but we maintain the projects over time. Uh, we don't just do something for a year and drop it. Um, and that's really critical also to building trust, which was in the first slide. And finally, scale by example. So we've been solicited over the years, why don't you take your work to this city or that city or this country? And we always explain to people that the work we do is so fundamentally grassroots. We need to know the personalities and the daily struggles of the people we work with. We're supporting them at an individual collective level. We're part of an ecosystem. We're part of a very complex web of organizations locally. We can't maintain that beyond this one area, this one city, this one political reality. But what we can do is we can constantly talk to groups in other parts of the world. We can share the model. They're gonna be doing it um, somewhere else. They'll tell us what, what they're doing and um, we can uh, work together from there. Finally, just some concluding thoughts, you know, um, as you know, planners, architects, there are a lot of double standards when it comes to different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, and, and, and areas of our cities and countries. You know, we talk about tactical urbanism, like it's this hot new thing, but that's what favelas are. They're tactical urbanism. There's a, you know, we talk about hacking and maker spaces. Well, favelas are basically uh, doing those things every day. Um, we have, you know, in architecture now, this trend towards risky playgrounds. Uh, that, you know, that's probably the biggest double standard um, uh, on that page. And then, you know, we have model, you know, <laughs> architecture that's recognized internationally, whether it's Habitat 67 in Canada, uh, whether it's um, UNESCO sites like Valparaiso. Um, this is a picture of uh, Santorini versus a favela. Again, Santorini versus 
a favela in Rio. Um, you know, going back to the slide of Valparaíso, it's recognized as a UNESCO site for its vernacular urban fabric adapted to the hillsides and its unusual system of uh, funicular lifts and improvised urban life and unique architecture. These were all things that exist in favelas. In fact, when I visited Valparaíso, I was told that it was favelas, right? So most of the cities that developed in the world that we think of as UNESCO sites today were actually developed informally. So we need to drop these double standards. We need to think differently about these communities. Um, you know, what if Rio embraced the unique history of each one of its favelas and recognized their contribution and supported their future in ways that honored that history, the vocation of each community? We could have an incredibly diverse, exciting city that really built on its qualities. What if we invested in decentralized planning where community control, communities control their destinies and allies support those visions? Right. And finally, what if Rio set an example for the world? We have some of the oldest informal settlements that have been allowed to persist. Um, this is part of the history of neglect that we've talked about here, the lack of investment over many generations now. But now these communities are here to stay. They're an important part of our city. They want to remain and improve. That's what the average resident of a favela wants is to stay there and see their community improve. So what if we did this? And what if we did this in a way that could be a model for informal, for cities where informal settlements are developing going forward? So I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to present uh, this talk. And I hope students will reach out to me at my email below. Um, I look forward to the conversation this Friday, uh, and um, I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much.